Good evening and thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Um, we are now going to hear from our high school student government rep. Good evening, Board of Ed and Plainview Olbeth Page community. I'm excited to report the recent and upcoming events going on around the high school. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Zachary Zeltler, and I'm a junior at John F. Kennedy High School, and I'm the Student Government Board of Ed representative for the 2021 to 2022 school year. The past couple of weeks have been very busy in the high school. Since I last addressed you on Monday the 1st, the 11th grade guidance night was held on Tuesday. Wednesday after school, DECA held their school-wide kickball tournament, and the talent show was held on Friday night in person and virtually. Each of these events were a huge success. This past week, Monday night was family night, where students enjoyed a day off from homework and tests, and families were able to support local businesses offering family night deals, including Best Buddies main event fundraiser. We hope everyone had a great time. Wednesday night was the live streamed High School Engineering Awareness Night, and Friday, Hobots hosted its Bella Vista fundraiser. Throughout the week, Animal Rescue Club held a food and supply drive for local animal shelters. The SAD Club and National Honor Society held a food drive in the main lobby, which will continue into next week. DECA held a fundraiser for Alex's Lemonade Stand at Sugar Crazy on Friday and around town this weekend. And on Saturday, National Honor Society held a food drive at the Plainview Shopping Center. We hope everyone was able to come out to support these great school organizations. Looking into this week, this afternoon was another session of our freshman seminar with our school admin and counselors. And throughout the day and into this evening, Pobots is hosting another Bella Vista fundraiser. Thursday through Saturday will be our high school fall play in the LGI. Good luck to all. Also Saturday, the orchestra will be hosting a fundraiser at Chipotle. Moving on to next week, many of our diverse clubs will continue to hold meetings around the building. Tuesday afternoon, we will be joined by a representative alum from the United States Military Academy in the LGI 10th period. DECA will host its Cupcake Wars fundraiser event in the cafe 11th period, and the evening will be the Fall Varsity and JV Sports Award Ceremony. And of course, students and staff will enjoy a well-deserved four-day weekend. Happy Thanksgiving, POB. We have many exciting events going on throughout the next couple of weeks in the high school, and we highly encourage students to participate in those that interest them. To find out more information about these events going on for our students in the high school, please visit the daily announcements, which can be found on our school's homepage. Thank you, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Zach. Good evening, Board of Ed. Oh, I forgot he's not actually there. <laughs> well, thank you. I now like to invite up to the mic um, our middle school student government representative, Amanda Klein. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Amanda Klein and I'm Matlin Middle School's school president. October was a busy month at Matlin Middle School. We opened the month with student council elections and jumped right into Pride Week. We were so excited to come together as a school for the first time in two years for our outdoor pep rally. We shared our school spirit over the course of the week decorating banners, showcases, and dressing for theme days. We concluded our week to, together again on the track for a unity parade. Thanks to the generosity of our Matlin families, we were able to have another successful Pride Card fundraiser. Matlin had talent. Our talent show featured singers, dancers, magicians, pianists, cellists, and concluded with a fun staff performance. It truly was a wonderful night for all. November has brought out the giving spirit at Matlin. Matlin Grand Pals and Service Club joined together to fill holiday stockings and created holiday cards for troops. Students met virtually with the Atria residents while participating in this activity. The Atria will be sending our stockings and holiday cards overseas to the troops. Matlin MAP groups and Service Club members are working with the Rudman Family Food Pantry, MIYJCC Project PACE, 
MIYJCC POB Cares, MIYJCC Seniors of Syosset, JASA, and Jericho Cares to create non-perishable Thanksgiving packages filled with traditional Thanksgiving items for their clients. Malin's staff is busy preparing home-cooked meals to be delivered to the clients as well. TAG is collecting new unwrapped toys for Cohen's Children's Hospital through December 13th. A bin is located outside of the Matlin main office if anyone would like to donate. On the other side of town at POB Middle School during the first two months of school, students are adjusting well. We have had many virtual school events, including student council elections, club fair, spirit card sales, sports pep rally, and veterans tea. We have also had many virtual family events where the PTA has offered a Kahoot trivia night for our, student, for our students. POB Middle School is eager to start quarter two. Thank you. Thank you very much and you have a happy Thanksgiving. And now we're going to go on to board announcements. I just wanted to wish everyone in the community a wonderful Thanksgiving spent with some of the special people in your lives. Um, we all have so much to be thankful for. And on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank all of our administrators, teachers, all of our other staff members, and our parents for all that you do to improve the education and lives of our students. I would also like to remind you to be safe over Thanksgiving because what you and your children do will affect our ability to keep students and staff healthy and in school following Thanksgiving. Thank you. Lauren. So as Zach mentioned, on Wednesday, the 10th of October, the POBOTS hosted their annual engineering awareness night. Usually they would have students from all over come into the schools and participate in many Steam is fun activities such as penny bridges, straw rockets, engineering, and squishy circuits. Um, they even had the opportunity to drive the Pobots competition robot. Due to the current climate and need to adhere to the building safety regulations, the Pobots could not invite the community into the school this year, but they found a way to engage the community in, in STEM. They designed an interactive live Steam from the shop that anyone could watch with their YouTube channel. All the activities were able to be done with materials that they found in, their, in most households. And all these activities demonstrated engineering principles that the Pullbots and, engineer, and engineers in their field that, use, that they use every day. Attendees also got to tour a tour of the machine shop where the Pullbots construct their robots and they got to see footage from their most recent practice competition at halfway at Half Hollow Hill School. In addition, the team demonstrated their Lego robots, similar to those which were made and competed by with the four district teams at the middle school level. After this, some of the members drove around their most recent robot named Marlin and explained how it was built and designed. The full live stream is available to watch on YouTube. The channel name is First Team 353 Pullbots. For more information, check out their website at, POB, at pobbots.com. Thank you, Lauren. Other, uh, Seth? What? Okay, Seth. Okay, good evening. Uh, earlier today, Debbie and I had the wonderful opportunity to visit Pasadena Elementary to celebrate Kindness Day where they unveiled their peace poll. And uh, despite the cold and the wind, um, the entire building was out and it was a beautiful ceremony. I know Dr. O'Mara and many of the central were there as well. Um, it was a wonderful visual reminder for everyone to be kind and uh, how much uh, better the world would be if we all just took a moment to think, be friendly, um, understanding, patient, um, and overall just being kind. And so I wanna thank the kids who sang. I wanna thank Buildings and Grounds. Uh, Principal Heitner indicated that really B&G did a lot of the work, I think all of the work in building um, that um, 
not just the pole, but the, what would you call it around the, uh, you know, they had the rocks and the, the base of it, um, the landscaping. It was, yeah, it, it, it was great. It was beautiful. It was a great ceremony. Thank them. Congratulate Pasadena for a, a job well done and a, um, a wonderful kindness day. So. Thank you, Seth. Any other board announcements? Okay, superintendent announcement. Well, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, we have the Matlin Middle School gratitude video to the Board of Education. If you recall at our last meeting, there were some technical difficulties on the part of the superintendent. So um, we've now um, fired me from that role of playing videos and have turned it over to Mr. Donna Rumo. So I'd like to turn you over to the Matlin Middle School students who want to show their gratitude. Hi, thank you for all you do. Thank you for helping our community. And thank you for making it a safe place while well, coronavirus. But that's not gonna stop us. So here's thank you in four languages. Merci pour tout, votre travail acharné. Gracias pour tout, su ado, trabajo. And gashin nin de xingning la dong. Finally, thank you for all your hard work. Bye, have a good day. Keep being our role models and keep shining. Bye. Hello, I'm Jane Lukwitz. And I love school and homework a lot, and I'm very thankful that you guys make sure we have a great education and make sure we have great teachers and making us feel safe and happy at our schools. And, and um, it really means a lot to all of us. Um, that you, and, it, and I appreciate a lot how you make sure we have a good education and make us feel safe and happy. Thank you. Thank you, Board of Ed. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you to the Board of Education for being so cooperative and helping us throughout these past years. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Evan. Thank you so much for everything you've done for the POB District. Thank you. I just wanted to thank the Board of Education for all that they do for our district. Being able to learn in person this year is amazing. Thank you for all that you do. That was worth the wait, right? That was worth the wait. That was wonderful. We should celebrate. Thank you all. You all. <laughs> I know they're not listening, but maybe somebody will thank them for that. That was wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay. Just a few announcements. The Regeneron Sci Science Talent Search, uh, POB will be well represented this year with over 20 students submitting their projects for consideration. Just for those of you who may not be aware, this contest has nearly 1,900 students enter each year. So POB represents about 1% of that. And we're really looking forward to seeing the outcome of that. And a quick thank you to Mr. Tessar, who have led these students and our research students at JFK High School in this endeavor. Uh, today's Newsday cover story, hackers target Long Island schools, describe the vulnerability in school districts' computer systems and the financial impact it has had on some local districts. This is an area POB takes extremely seriously and to where we invest substantial time and resources. Our cybersecurity system is not a static one as it works against cyber criminals whose sole purpose is to infiltrate systems. We will have a BOE report on the current state of technology in POB at the next meeting, November 29th, although we don't often publicly discuss our security member measures. Um, I too was at the Peace Poll unveiling today at Pasadena. It was great to be part of the excitement around the ceremony and the Peace Poll, which will serve as a symbol of peace and inclusivity as the peace message inscribed on it was uh, inscribed with several languages spoken at Pasadena. Theater is back in person at POB this Friday and Saturday evening, almost Maine will air on the stage at JFK High School. So those of you who have missed live theater, please seek out a ticket. I will be there Friday night and I cannot wait to so be back. We. Yes, I even have Mr. O'Mara joining me. Okay. 
Um, last week, I participated in the New York State Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting where leaders in SED heard from the field on issues with state testing, accountability, and the teacher certification project process that has led to shortages in critical areas around the state. The leaders in SED will be discussing these topics with the commissioner and the Board of Regents, and we're hoping to see some relief in these areas through the Board of Regents actions. And lastly, we are often reminded of the remarkable deeds of our students academically, athletically, and in the performing arts. We have a student who has done something pretty extraordinary with her time and talent. I'd like to share this three minute video with you about the work Haley Richmond has done in eighth grade and now she's a ninth grader at JFK High School to support people living with Alzheimer's disease. This weekend, she traveled to Indianapolis to the 17th annual Power of Children Awards where she was one of five children presented with this award. So I turn you over to our last video, it's three minutes and that's the end of my announcements. When I was four years old, my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is a disease in the brain where people can't always remember stuff and it could make them frustrated and angry because they will not remember. Sometimes it would be hard seeing her have Alzheimer's disease, but I would know just because she had Alzheimer's disease wouldn't change the way that I loved her. I started bringing puzzles to my grandma because I noticed when I would do that it would calm her down. When I would bring puzzles to my grandma's assisted living and nursing home, I would involve her roommates and other people who lived there. I would see how happy it would make them. So I started getting all my friends together and we would all go there. And I thought, why can't we do this worldwide? Why can't everyone feel as happy as these people? So that's how we start Puzzle Time. I'm Haley Richmond and my project is Puzzle Time. Puzzle Time is where for an hour of fun, we take puzzles and we pair up a kid with a senior for an intergenerational connection. Puzzle Time helps people who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. When you solve puzzles with them, it stimulates the visual cortex in the brain and it calms them down. Many people can contact us and we can give them facilities where they can place puzzles to. We set up puzzle drives. We're trying to get puzzles into facilities who don't have a lot of resources. The actual puzzles, we partner with a company to create more senior-oriented puzzles. The Springbok puzzles have 36 pieces and the images have adult-like themes such as a sky that seniors can relate to and talk about. The families of the seniors are really appreciative of us. They noticed that the puzzles were making them less irritated and they were able to connect with them more and they said that solving the puzzles brought them back and they were able to have a conversation again and just connect again. Since the pandemic has started, we are not allowed to go into the facilities, so we do puzzle time virtually and our volunteers send cards to the people in the facilities so they can still connect with them. I am really thankful to the Children's Museum of Indianapolis for giving me this award money. I am planning to use it to give puzzles to state-run facilities who are low on resources, and I plan to write a book educating kids about Alzheimer's disease. I love helping people, and when I saw how Alzheimer's affected my grandma, I felt I want to help other people, even if it might be too late for my grandmother. I want people to have knowledge on this disease. Around five years into the project, my grandmother passed away. When my grandmother passed, it made me very sad, but I know that I had a lot of fun solving of her, and I will never forget that. But we are still trying to keep puzzle time going and get to as many facilities as we can. We have puzzle time in over 36 states now, and almost seven countries. I would tell all the young people out there that just because they might be little does not mean they are any less capable than adults. And I want to show them that just a simple puzzle can help make a big difference in change. The district's a better place knowing there are students like Kelly walking our halls. That was wonderful. Thank you for showing it to us and thank you, Haley. Um, okay, now we're going to go on to reports and discussions. Um, first, we're going to discuss new course proposals. Dr. Bolin. Thank you, everyone. Um, very excited to be here tonight to share with you our new course proposals for the 2022-2023 school year. Let me just get this up for full screen so everyone can see. Great. 
Um, so the first course that we have for you this evening, and the, the program will go in order of alf alphabet alphabetical order by uh, department. So the first is in our business department. It is a course revision. Uh, we currently have a course called Advanced Computer Concepts and Applications Excel. Um, the revision here would be that now we would like this course to be able to run through Long Island University for college credit. Uh, so the substance of the course does not change, but uh, it does provide the opportunity of the course to be um, uh, uh, to be able to receive college credit for students. They would be given uh, three credits for the semester of the course. Uh, and that dual enrolled course uh, provides then students with a, a transcript from Long Island University that they get to bring with them uh, to college. So uh, that is the first course that we have would be a revision. Uh, and so the name of that would then to denote the uh, co-seeding uh, would be College Microsoft Excel. The second course we have uh, is a new course. We actually run this course in a version already of AP Capstone Research. Uh, but this would be uh, a course that would allow our students in 12th grade to receive English credit for this course. Uh, currently, as it stands in its current iteration, the course is a, uh, an elective credit for students that can take in 11th or 12th grade. Um, that, that option would still remain the same, yet we would add the ability of this course, therefore naming it English 12 AP Capstone Research, uh, so that students who take our AP seminar course uh, which many students take in their 10th grade year for English credit. Around 125 students are taking that course now. Um, and then we have approximately 40 that go on to take the AP Capstone Research. Uh, we believe that by opening up to English 12 AP Capstone Research, more students will take advantage of the ability to get an AP Capstone Diploma, uh, which really entails the students completing AP Capstone Seminar and AP Capstone Research, along with four other AP classes to get the AP Capstone Diploma designation. So uh, by providing this alternate option for, sen uh, for seniors uh, to get English credit, um, the great thing about this is that for those seniors that took the AP Seminar course but are not so inclined toward um, social science research or bench research, science research in a really quantitative measure, um, they can take this course instead uh, and do a research paper on a topic that they might be interested in. Let's say it's in music or art or literature uh, and do some research in those areas and be able to get the English credit in 12th grade for that. So uh, that would be a very exciting thing to offer for our seniors in the program. The next course is a new course in our music department. Uh, this is an entirely brand new course, something that we call Modern Music, a survey of American music. Uh, the course would provide students for uh, students in, in our school not involved necessarily in a class in music. Uh, to be able to expand their music um, education. Uh, particularly, we want to, in this course, we would love to see how uh, students can learn about music and the reciprocal nature of how music and American culture impact one another. Um, so if you think about um, uh, songs maybe from uh, the 1960s, uh, that might have been like war protest songs, uh, you know, and how culture influenced music and then how music can influence culture instead. So uh, this would be a great new course to add. Uh, it would be a full year course uh, that we would run for one credit uh, for anyone in ninth through 12th grade. Another new course, uh, this time in our physical education department, this would be sports physiology and medicine. Uh, this is something that we're interested in, in providing uh, another outlet for students who might be interested in sports medicine, uh, but also adding in sports physiology. So understanding how uh, exercise science impacts the body and all the various uh, systems in their musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, nervous system, et cetera. Uh, and then the second half of the course uh, would focus on sports medicine uh, and the branch of medicine that deals with physical fitness and the treatment and prevention of uh, injuries related to sports and exercise. Um, this course would also be uh, considered a PE credit and would ca count toward a student's PE uh, credits that they need in order to graduate. Uh, so that would run a full year alternate day, much like our PE classes run uh, for half a credit. Another new, uh, another revision, this time in the social studies department. Um, <clears throat> we currently run a course uh, entitled U.S. History or History Through Film. Uh, and what we're looking to do is sort of revise the class to include other forms of media um, as we have had that course running for some time, but realizing that there's other ways that uh, we could study U.S. history. So for instance, through podcasts and TED Talks, music or YouTubers, uh, and it includes opportunity for civic engagement that ties to the, the civic readiness standards that the state has brought forward. So uh, that would be a rename and you, uh, history through film renamed into American culture through media and music. Um, again, in Soul Studies, a new course. 
uh, this course would replace the current power and politics course, which we run. Uh, and that course focuses on international policy and politics. This course I'm very excited about. It's uh, titled American Politics, Conflict and Compromise. Uh, it really is responsive to the current state of affairs in the United States today, uh, giving students the ability to have a safe, open and honest discourse in the classroom uh, in a very nonpartisan way. Uh, encouraging them to learn from alternate sides of the uh, political spectrum and, and able to engage in conversations where they can actually participate in active listening to hear what other sides have to say about political issues that are in our country today. Um, this is a very new course uh, and something that I think is vital for uh, educating our students of how to be critical thinkers, how to be uh, literate in terms of news literacy, uh, and also as a way to uh, help lower the temperature of discourse that we've seen in the country. And I'm really proud of uh, the department for putting together a course like this. Um, you see at the end, it stands there, it's uh, dealing with complex issues as America enters its second century of global leadership. And so it's important that we're able to have these conversations in a very nonpartisan and open way. Uh, so we're excited about that course. Um, there are some revisions in social studies as well. Um, <clears throat> currently, students who conduct research might take uh, another half year credit along with AP Psychology, and that course has been called AP Psychology Lab. Uh, and then if they and move on from that, uh, the course was, is called Social Science Research. It gets a little confusing with the research pathways that we have, so in order to help clarify a little bit, um, those students who want to begin with Social Science Research uh, attached to the AP Psychology course, that would now be called Introduction to Social Science Research. And then moving on, naturally, then the, the, the course would be called Advanced Social Science Research. It clarifies a little bit for um, the pathway the students are taking and makes more sense uh, as it looks on a transcript. Uh, AP Psychology Lab might not ring clear to everyone, but an Introduction to Social Science Research is a much clearer course name. Uh, so those would be some of the revisions in social studies. On uh, special education, we have some revisions as well. Uh, our special class in Earth Science, English 10, English 12, and Social Studies 12. Uh, we would like to amend these courses to add in the public speaking requirement that we have for graduation to ensure that students are meeting our district goal. Uh, so we'd like to add these four courses as places where students can receive their uh, public speaking requirement for graduation. There are a couple of ongoing revisions that I just wanted to mention this evening, things that are not necessarily in play for the 22-23 school year as they are already in progress right now, uh, and also some that are still in the works and need just a little bit more clarification. You'll see what I'm speaking of. Um, so the first is aquatic training. Right now we offer aquatic training, uh, but we did some work this summer uh, to make sure that uh, our instructors for that course would be able to then uh, provide the ability for students to be trained as lifeguards in taking that course. So we are able to, and we're hopefully, hopefully able to open uh, this section up in this spring for students who are interested in becoming uh, trained lifeguards, certified lifeguards through that program. Uh, so that would actually be for a 21-22 school year. Uh, in addition, we've been doing a lot of work with our CTE program pathways. Uh, for 21-22, we added early childhood education as a track alongside the other CTE pathways we have in business law and also in business management and entrepreneurship. We're also looking to expand into a fourth pathway for the 23-24 school year. And uh, we are a, sort of exploring that option right now, not prepared necessarily to say it, it's ready to go, but we have a couple of uh, uh, hoops to go through, but we hope to have that done in time for students to be able to sign up for another CTE pathway in video and film production for uh, the 23-24 school year. So we are excited to have that happen as well. Um, the last revision that we have is related to our super accelerated math students. Um, currently, we're looking to devise an honors by achievement plan for our students who are, we were calling super accelerated. So they're taking geometry in eighth grade. Um, currently, our, our students in seventh grade who are super accelerated begin uh, their math program with algebra regions in grade seven. Uh, and then I've been going into geometry honors um, when that course was held at the high school. This year, we were able to have that course be held at one of the middle schools, which is great, uh, but really moving in line with uh, from the regents right up to that honors in eighth grade isn't necessarily as developmentally appropriate as we want it to be. So renaming that course into a geometry accelerated, giving students the ability to um, 
achieve an honors weight for that course would be great. Uh, but it also allows those that are super accelerated, but at a, a level that might not be honors to still be able to have access to that coursework. So uh, that's where we're looking in terms of our ongoing revisions for new courses this year, as well as the new course proposals for 22-23. Thank you so much. Questions, comments, Tara? So thank you for all of that. Sure. Um, there are definitely some courses I probably want to audit. Um, <clears throat> pretty awesome. I am exciting. I do have a question about the course on American politics. Sure. Um, I think I agree with you. It's very timely and it, it's extremely important. My only concern would be exactly what the course is designed to address, which is making sure that we're able to look at both sides and we're not doing something in a partisan way. How are are there how are we going to make sure that this is being done, you know, effectively it, with to fidelity the way we envisioned it when we created it? Sure. Yeah, part of that uh, deals, especially with uh, summer curriculum writing that would go along with this class. Uh, however, that is all centered upon the ability to teach our students how to have these conversations, right? And so the entire purpose of the course is to be nonpartisan. And you bring up a really good, a good point. In a very polarized blue track and red track America that we live in right now, the way that we begin to uh, move those tracks together uh, is to be able to hear what the other side might be saying. And that's the job of our teachers, uh, to be able to uh, give our students the form to be able to, to learn from one another in a very um, methodical and systematic way, uh, that active listening part. Um, there'll be training for teachers uh, as well in terms of how to facilitate those conversations um, and opening students' eyes to uh, what people are saying as opposed to what necessarily they're just feeling. Uh, and I think that's really what we've been missing in some of that political discourse in the world today. It's okay to be political. It's not okay to be partisan. Uh, political is those discussions about how one is feeling on one side or the other, whereas partisan is, is putting that emotion into it. And so the purpose of this course is to sort of remove that emotion or to understand what it's, where it's coming from, to really hear what the other side's issues might be on both sides. And so... Well, just it'll be function of the curriculum and, and, and training to make sure that um, nobody's personal views are getting, you know, um, in the way of being able to create that environment. Correct. But, um, um, even unintentionally because mm -hmm. of one thing or another. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm a former school studies teacher. And so. Uh, Adults can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I like to use the word uh, um, agnostic. So uh, the teacher of this course will really have to be able to illustrate both sides for students. Um, it's quite possible that they uh, could be in a classroom where, let's say out of 24 students, 22 may be of one political ideology and two may not. So maybe the teacher starts to show another side with where the other two students might be. You might not always have an even split down the, down the middle. And so it's a job of the, that educator to help the students learn how to have those discussions and to keep a forum that's open for those students to be able to uh, discuss freely. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Tara. Questions, comments, Susan? Thank you so much for the presentation and thank you to all the chairs. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Tara. There's definitely some classes here that I would love to come back and uh, uh, what it or go along. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so, uh, particularly in social studies, thank yeah. you, uh, Mrs. Clemency. So, I do have a couple of questions. I'm sure. going to start with uh, English. So, narrative writing, and this is something that I've been speaking about, and I guess maybe I haven't been particularly clear. And I do appreciate the nod to that this new AP research class would provide an option to AP um, literature. So if a student want, didn't want to read certain of the literature, they had an option within the AP. But I would like to somehow think about 
engaging our students into more narrative because AP capstone research is still another argumentative and still another scientific or persuasive type of writing style. I know we do teach narrative writing, but the, since Common Core, I feel like the focus has been on that database writing. And I've seen students struggle with personal statements in college applications or in, the, in some other uh, um, scenarios. So I would like to ask if it is possible, if we can find engaging a alternative classes in our English department that would do would strike upon that narrative writing option. I personally remember my senior year here in Kennedy that I was we had a class that was taught by um, the chairperson, Mr. Mays. When you walked into his class, he spoke in the Shakespearean tone and he just wanted to make you the imagery of the day. You know, Gerald Mays, yes. I mean, like thinking about my past ma memories this morning in the dark sky and the, the beautiful, brilliant streaks coming across the Eastern view. I just thought about him and how like important to develop those imageries. And if it would be possible or if the, the department could entertain that scenario. And if it, maybe if we talked about where we put the regents exams um, if we could open up a child's schedule so that they could explore something to that effect. Um, there's nothing wrong with the AP Capstone option, but if we could add, that would be the question to an inquiry if possible. Um, I think that's something we can definitely look into. I know, you know, we have our creative writing courses that run. However, it, it it's always good to look for different options for students and to providing different avenues for for our our children to be able to express themselves in different ways and, and creative writing and narrative writing is definitely one of those you know I, I think of it even as we're thinking about the cte pathway in uh you know video production there could be some writing courses that go along with that um for some creative narrative writing you know we can run a pov soap opera uh and students can act it out and there could be the narrative writing that goes along with that um, so there's lots of ways that we can help to incorporate some of that that could then be part of that pathway, uh, which would be great. Yep. So I, I definitely appreciate it. Sure. Just here, look, you're off the cusp. Look at that creativity. That Absolutely. Soap <laughs> operas, <laughs> novellas. Um, a question about the geometry acceleration. Yeah. Are you, I think we all know I have some reservations about super acceleration, but one of the practicality. Is it still the the edict, I guess, or the law, the educational law, that if a student takes a high school class in seventh grade, they are not to get high school credit. For Correct. It. Yeah. So that if they, so if they take algebra in seventh grade, that's not going on their transcript. Correct. The only thing that would indicate that they had had it is because they are now taking multivariable calculus in twelfth grade, for example. Uh, yes. Also, the algebra regents would go on the transcript, but not are the you allowed course. To do that? Yeah, the region score go any time a student would takes a region also, score. And how would that work then into the high school GPA? That does it just goes on as as a score. As a score. So like a standalone, right. it would be a standalone. Correct. So if a student didn't decide it, you know, in let's say tenth grade, they don't want to go on anymore because in theory they've already taken enough math class, but will they still be able to have enough for a high school diploma? Yes, so they need three credits of math. So the first credit would come in eighth grade, and then eight, nine, and ten would be the second and third and, years. But if they, so they, so they, they would have to stay in math. I'm not saying that a child is going this route, but if somebody decided to change their mind, I just want to make sure we, if a mind is changed, because they are losing a year of credit, in theory, that they would be able to change their mind and not Correct. be penalized somehow, because they, because they would not get that algebra credit. That, that credit does goes away if they choose to take it in seventh grade. Correct. They don't get high school credit for that in seventh grade. They would still need three math credits, the first starting in eighth grade and then going through 10th. Yeah. Okay. So, but and we are vetting these families that they understand this and they understand if they change their mind. I just, I know it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse. No, I, just want to I have sure. to tell you, Susan, this is exactly why I think it's a very progressive change, Dr. Bones proposing here because 
the leap from regents level to honors is not appropriate for middle schoolers or all middle schoolers, even though they have um, exceptional mathematical abilities. So this honors by achievement allows them to delve deeply on their own should they should they be able to handle the regents level and then go further and at the end when they produce the honors additional work that's that is what would give them the honors distinction and the weight on their transcript but you know um that's a that's a problem we've been seeing that we've tried to correct with ninth grade eighth graders who've taken algebra they automatically thought i'm supposed to go to geometry honors in ninth grade or to earth um living environment honors Honestly. and they struggled so really that's the difference just accelerating doesn't mean you're ready for honors level work as a ninth grader so this is a way to fix that in the super acceleration right i, I mean i wholeheartedly agree because i'm there is a social component to when you're accelerating a student and the peer the peers and the home pressures and all that i just want to make sure because we spend so much time about that and i do i appreciate that and i also, also want to make sure that if a child does change their mind we are covering their bases even I have though to tell they, you it doesn't lock them into an honors track an right. honors track it's not the honors that's track. right like I'm just they can't drop out of it they can make a decision in ninth or tenth grade that this is where i'm going to stop taking my math courses still be okay for graduation still be up for um, an advanced regents diploma when they successfully complete algebra mm -hmm. two so yes yeah, all right thank you Welcome. I'd be really remiss if I didn't acknowledge the live curtain. So I'm sorry that <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. So thank you to Joe Braco, to Dr. Merrick, to Jim um, for bringing that on because I've only been sitting here for <laughs> six years. Susan, can you do commercial though? The only problem with this is students don't really know that much about it because we did this over the summer. So if you want to do commercials for spring registration so you can lifeguard at camp in the summer. Hey guys, you're right now minimum wage is about $18 an hour for a lifeguard. Moms and dads, just think about that. <laughs> and uh, being the camp lifeguard is like being the camp aunt or grandmother. But you don't have to have the same child all the time. You rotate. Just something to think about. <laughs> I'm back. Hello. Felt like I should have changed my tie or something. So uh, tonight we're all yeah, or hat or um, so tonight we're also presenting the the uh, results for our district uh, in ELA and math for students that took state exams back in the spring of 2021. Um, just a couple of quick notes on um, on some of the numbers uh, that are a little different this year and in years past, and to explain some of how the numbers compare, or I should say, don't compare um, to other years uh, in POB. So we had uh, 1,014 students take our ELA assessment and 944 students take the math assessment, approximately 42 and 40% respectively. Um, that is much lower uh, than we've had. Um, across the state, part, uh, participation is down dramatically. Typically the state has about 80% of students taking part in these uh, exams. Uh, and this year only 50% took part. Uh, and so that, is what really accounted for the delay in scores. Um, the reason why the numbers from this year cannot be compared to other years is that when the state typically gives the percentages of uh, two, ones, twos, threes, and fours, the percentages are based upon the total population for the district. So even if you had a high number of opt-out students, the percentage of students getting a number four was the percentage of students 
who got a number four in grade four, all of your grade four students. Um, this year, uh, the numbers are based upon only the students who took the exam. So the percentages of the students who got a four is only the percent of students who took the exam and got four, not out of the entire uh, population of the district. So that's why these numbers, there'll be a big asterisk from, from now on until forever uh, when we take a look at the results of 2021, because they really cannot be compared to other districts or other past years. Um, however, that being said, uh, when we take a look at the students who did take the exams in our district, we're really pleased with the results that you'll see uh, of how our students did across the board. Um, so if you take a look on the first slide that we'll take a look at, we'll look at our ELA results. Um, and you can see we really focus on um, highlighted in the in the blue on the side levels threes and fours. Um, and so when we take a look at our elementary schools, we are very happy with what we have for the numbers of students that took the exams. Again, remember about 42.4% of students took our ELA exams. And you can see in the elementary schools across grades three and four, our levels of proficiency going from 80% to 100%. Um, we've talked about RTI and MTSS here before. Really, if, if your students are achieving 80% and above, um, you're doing something good and something is working well. And so when we take a look at our elementary schools, we see um, really good results from them. Again, given the 42.4% took the exam, but we're happy with the results that we see there. Um, at our middle schools, we're also happy with the results that we see, especially in level two, level threes and fours. Um, you might note that there's a little bit of a dip in grade five and grade seven. Uh, when I do some comparison, I'm going to talk about how that looks across the region and the state, and you'll see there's a big trend that happens there. So at first look, you might say, oh, no, what's happening in, in fifth grade and seventh grade? But when we actually look at how it looks across the state, um, these numbers are excellent uh, compared to... Um, what we're seeing is some dips across the state in grade five and grade seven. Um, so those are our ELA numbers for both uh, the, the both middle schools as well as the four elementaries. Um, our mathematic results, when we take a look at that, again, 40% of our students taking these. Um, again, we're seeing some wonderful numbers uh, in terms of proficiency at our elementary schools, 91, 94, 93, 93, 94, 87, 92, and 89 percent proficiencies in grades three and four. Just absolutely wonderful work uh, from our students and our teachers there. Um, when we go and take a look at the uh, middle schools, you'll see uh, the proficiencies uh, alter a little bit, but I want to call your attention to actually the N or the number of students tested. For instance, in Matlin, take a look at the number of students tested in grade eight. The number is not a typo, it's eight. Eight students. Um, so when you take a look at a 50% proficient, that means four students scored three and four and four students did not. Um, and this is why when we take a look at those numbers, it's really important to look at what that N is. Uh, again, a POB, um, 25 students in eighth grade took the math exam. Also remember, our algebra students do not take um, that exam as well as our accelerated geometry students would not be taking that exam. So those students are removed from those numbers. So when we take a look at that, we really want to look at that with a grain of salt, especially also looking at the number of students tested. You see from grade five to grade eight, you'll see a drop off in grade seven and eight in terms of the numbers tested, which would also indicate that those numbers are not as um, valid as let's say when you have a larger number of students who take those exams. So we did some comparisons for you. First, these comparisons that I would give you are Plainview versus Nassau, Suffolk, Long Island, and New York State. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you take a look at the ELA scores in grades five and seven, um, while we have a little bit of a dip in grade five and seven for us, you see that dip is corresponding across the state. Um, so for instance, if you look at New York State, in grade four, 62%, and then in grade five, 47.4% getting level three and four, and then again in grade seven, 48.6%. That leads us to believe that there was something with the exam itself. Um, if we're seeing that dip across the board, we're seeing across the state, the, the, the island, Nassau, and Suffolk. Um, and so that leads us to believe something in those, those testing and that grading was not, was not good across the board. So um, we're still happy with our results, but it, it indicates something uh, with the test as opposed to with, uh, with our instruction. Um, and then you also see the comparative numbers for math as well. Again, Plainview did very well across the region. Um, if you just take a look, even the Nassau numbers, 
and the Suffolk numbers, just really, really wonderful results. Um, the next slide, even though we're at a public meeting, um, is we put together, even though I said we shouldn't compare, um, these are some of the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but these are the, the districts that we typically are featuring districts, districts that we compare ourselves with. Uh, but what I wanna bring your attention to on this slide, which I thought was important, is the percent not tested. And you see wide swings by district um, of the percent of students not tested. So on average, uh, we had 58% not tested in Plainview. Uh, Rockville Center had 54% not tested, but then Garden City only had 18% not tested. Uh, Massapequa had 71% not tested. So that's what really goes to show you the, the wide variety of numbers of students taking these exams and why the state took some time to try and figure out how they should pre present these scores, given how few students across the state really actually took them this year. Um, so all in all, we're, we're very happy with, with how the scores look uh, and um, at that, but there are other things that we can talk about. Uh, those are our math scores over there, also 60% not tested, and you'll see again the same differences. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mara, who will then speak about how we can really get a good sense, since only 40% of our students took these state exams, how do we have a sense of where our students are achieving right now and, and where we can best support them? Not at all. So I thank you so much, Dr. Bull, and, and um, I'm really glad we see how the other districts did because it's really important to understand when people cherry pick certain pieces of information that you're looking at the totality of the picture. And Dr. Bolin kept saying, we're still very happy with our results because remember, these were only the students who came to school for in-person instruction. Remote students who didn't come in to take these exams were left out. And depending on the school, we went somewhere between 18 and 22% of students on remote instruction. But what we do know from these numbers is our students were served well during the closure from March to June, leading up to this spring of 2020s, um, 2021's assessment uh, season. Soaring to new heights, thank you. Um, this is why we are so glad we brought in the NWA assessment because we have a tool that we use here that was brought in prior to closure that allows us to test students um, in a way that is quick, we get results very quickly. It's computer uh, it's computer based and adaptive. So it almost feels like to a student, the questions are getting a little bit hard, but then it levels off and I'm in my comfort zone. And that's where the test then stops to let the student know, this is where we've assessed you. The NWEA is program agnostic. So it's not what reading or math program you're using. It tests the standards and over 11 million students take the NWA on an annual basis. So all of the data is not just normed against Nassau, Suffolk, and New York, but across the country and in certain other countries. Um, what it also measures for us, besides just the student's proficiency, it measures the student's growth over time for as long as they're in that system. Can you just go to the next slide? We began our work with NWEA in the spring of 2019, only testing fourth and fifth grade students in ELA. In the fall of 2019, we moved it and opened it up to everybody in two through eight in ELA and math. And then we had the closure, so we couldn't measure that. But we have a cohort of students that we will have data from since 2019, which is really important data to look at. In the fall we um, and in the spring of 2021, we were able to do it for the students who came for in-person instruction. But most importantly, we were able to test all of our students in 2021 when they returned to school. And the biggest concern you'll hear in education is what was the learning loss? What was the impact of the pandemic? And you just saw our state scores didn't fluctuate. So we know a couple of important things just from our state data. You don't see gross volatility among our schools. You see pretty consist consistent proficiency rates among all six of our schools that sat for the state assessment. That lets us know our program is being followed with fidelity across all six schools and that we aren't a district of schools, but we're a school districts. And that's the tell when you have a district of schools, when you have volatility among schools and their scores. We found the same thing in our fall assessment of the NWEA, and I'll share that data. The one thing to notice with ELA, the NWEA only tests reading. It doesn't test writing. So when you look at the New York State ELA, that score is comprised of a student's reading and writing ability. The NWA only does its reading ability. 
the other slide, thank you. So you can see that all of the students that returned to us after the pandemic was over and everyone was back in person, we're seeing pretty excellent rates. You know, we only have a few students in, in a few places that are below that 80% mark that we use to determine if there's a significant problem we need to look at. But more importantly, these students sat for this about three weeks ago and we already have this data. We do not have to wait for the state test again in spring to find out where our students are at. We already know who the other 23% in second grade at Pasadena are that we have to start looking at to see why are they below in reading but 77% are at or above reading level. And then you can look at some of the outstanding rates in fourth grade. It's not surprising some of our second graders um, are a little bit below. These are the group of students that have not had a normal school year since kindergarten. You know, they're just coming back. So um, if you see over in um, the fifth through eighth grade, pretty substantial numbers. They held their reading ability throughout this pandemic. And the good news is this is solid baseline data. So when we come back to you in the spring, you will see the growth from that. Our math data also tells a similar story. We have consistency among all four schools. We are so happy that the pandemic didn't interrupt the work of the new program, Go Math. It actually strengthened it because all of the teachers then were able to keep pace with one another through the closure and through last year's um, quarantine classrooms, students getting sick, teachers out sick with COVID, teachers on quarantine from COVID, that the steadiness of the program sustains student learning throughout. And if you look at our middle school scores with mathematics, they're pretty impressive. And again, these are students that had significant interruptions in fourth grade, in third grade, but in fifth grade, they came out pretty strong with their math skills. So we're pretty happy to see where this group of students in the middle schools will be going throughout the course of this year. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments, Tara? Thank you for all of this. Um, love data. So what, when you say there, um, there's not much volatility between the scores, what do you mean? Like, how do you define that term? You're not seeing that one elementary school only has 77% passing rate or at or above reading levels, and then another school in the 90s. You don't see that throughout. And there were times where you would see uh, certain schools performing, a, you know, you'd see greater discrepancies. We can explain some of the bigger differences of 10 points due to the um, population of special ed in that building, the population of ENLs, and of course, the ever-present uh, free and reduced lunch population. There are variations in certain schools that have higher um, populations of those types of students and the other students who are just coming back. Some schools had less students, fewer students on remote than other schools did. Okay, because I did see one slide, I think Pasadena at one point was 80 and there was like a 90 some, one of the schools was the 90s. I think Stratford yeah. at one point was a 77, mm -hmm. exactly, I think. Yeah. And but. By and large, you do, and then I think there was a little bit of, I don't want to use the word volatility, but um, in the ELA, I guess, NWEA reading results for the fifth grade, but it, it, nothing, I think it was like about a 10 point spread. Right. But um, but by and large, I, I, I think the it's fantastic that we're, we're getting this data and we're using it because it's allowing us to address those gaps like you're saying, or figure out why they're there if they're accurately there. Um, in terms of the NWEA, I recognize that we're talking about proficiency, but do we also use that data to determine growth so that if somebody is not showing growth as opposed to, yes, they're, they're still proficient, but they're not growing or growing at the what you would expect them to, what a parent might expect, which might not be the same because if, as they get older, maybe, the growth will slow, but to make sure that they're continuing to make progress and not just they hit like a plateau and they're not moving. I have to tell you, that's one of the, our favorite reports at NWA. I don't know if you want to show it, Dr. Bolin, but it's called the quadrant report and it exactly um, illustrates what you're talking about. It is able to tell us which students are high performers and had high growth. The ones I always worry about are high performers, but low growth. 
because they get to hide underneath always getting the A plus pleasure to have in class. And they can slip along for several years and not show that they have not moved in their reading or math ability. And those are the kids I typically get worried about because they hit high school and they don't have the work ethic to match the demands of now I really have to work to learn. And then there is the low growth, low performance group, which is also worrisome because a special ed student who might always be lower in proficiency, if he or she doesn't grow throughout the year, but they just come out low, some parents may think like you're just always going to be a little behind in, you know, there'll always be this gap, but we want to make sure that gap doesn't grow while that student's with us. We want to make sure we're closing the gap as best as possible. And I don't know if you have that. So this is the report. And we get behind each one of those dots is a student. And if you hover over it, it will give you the student name. No, we would <laughs> never do that. Get Tara Rock. It's static. <laughs> Have, look at this. But what's so nice is this is the fall one, right, Dr. Bolin? Yes. I love this report because when you look at the fall, this teacher may think, I have a class of superstars. And she may not have to work too hard to push those kids because they're going to do okay and show up okay on paper in getting good scores because you see how it's skewed that way. This teacher has high performers, high growth, and high performers, low growth. She's got a challenge because she has some really – interesting work she has to do as far as differentiation and enrichment work to move those kids. But she also has this little baby in the corner in the pink, <laughs> low growth, low performer. She has to address that student, but then she also has to make sure the low performer in the top orange quadrant there knows, boy, you hit it out of the park. You might not feel like you're a superstar all the time in school, but I wanna let you know, you outpace a lot of people in your growth, even though you're still a little bit below grade level in your reading and writing and math skills. So that actually goes to my question of how are we, what are we doing with this? How are we looking at this? So it's not just proficiency, but also the growth and all of that. Are we using that? And how do we expect to see it being used? Like I put the timeline up there on purpose. And we said this to the parents during the NWA town hall night. Teachers are just getting this training. We were seriously stopped with NWA when we had closure and then reopening last year. And you know, it's true teachers are burnt out and teachers have had to learn a lot. This was not a priority, but we're back with it. We've shared these reports with our leadership team and we know right away some principals turned it around and teachers will get more comfortable with those reports and get the adequate training to speak to them with parents. But in terms of the reports, once we get them and we know that this is what's happening and we're starting to track the progress, yeah. what as parents, you know, if, if your child isn't showing, let's say they are a high achiever or they're not showing as much growth or maybe they're lower and they're not showing as much growth. What do we, ex what can we expect to see? Like, we're not just taking should, the data, we're should, doing something yeah, about it, right? Ex expect to see a plan from your child. And I think this works and um, you've said this from time to time, it would be great if at one point in this district, every student could have his own IEP. This gives the potential for that because what another report that comes from the NWEA is a personal growth goal sheet for students and teachers to work on together with parents of, if this was your score now, and these were your areas of strength and weaknesses, we can target some instruction and work for you to do so that you can move toward the projected growth goal. And uh, that's so what we talk about next steps from here. This is what mm -hmm. we're talking about. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren and then Seth. Oh, I didn't even see Gary, sorry. So I was gonna ask um, with next steps from here, have we seen an increase in AIS um, services um, due to this? And, um, and then second, um, have we seen students who are maybe in eighth grade taking, algebra, like taking accelerated algebra that had to be brought back down? Is there an increase in those students due to the pandemic and due to these outcomes? Dr. Bowen has that data. Sure. So in terms of AIS, what the, this is very helpful for the AIS teachers. We haven't seen a tremendous spike in the number of students that are receiving AIS services, but this provides such clear data to our AIS providers. Uh, one of the reports that Dr. Mara was speaking about is there's a learning continuum report. So you can click on one of the dots and it can tell you where the student is poised to grow, not what they're not check their successful at this, but here are the next goals or skills that they can be uh, working on. And so that's what's great for AS providers. Um, in terms of our math numbers, 
we we have seen um and, and we're taking a look at at our middle schools i would say we have seen a, a uh, an uptick in one of our buildings with the number of students who have dropped down from the um, algebra accelerated track in eighth grade uh, in the other middle school, it's been consistent for the last three years. Um, so there always is movement. Um, we have seen a little bit of an uptick that can be just from students um, and stamina uh, and just coming back and not being prepared to just do work. And so uh, it is something that we're working on. We're working with the, the building leader and the teachers there to make sure we understand um, where those drops might be coming from. Uh, but I would say one of the buildings is definitely consistent with over the last three years, some students are they're ready to go or all my friends are going to do it. So I'm going to do it. And we do see a, a pretty standard number of students that do drop down from the algebra into the map back into the math eight. Thank you. So a couple, uh, it's a couple comments, um, all related to what's on the screen and the conversation we're having. At the last meeting, uh, we described some of our board recognition week uh, get togethers, um, I should, uh, visits, I should say. Um, and uh, Mr. Batan and I, as I mentioned last time, had the um, opportunity to meet with Ms. Anino to go over exactly the kind of data that we're seeing on the screen now. And she, you know, without divulging any individual students, used several examples also looked at the the state data but in particular the nwea data um and um she showed us several several classes like this um and we talked about what the next steps are yeah they're next steps, but it's already happening that's the positive thing right like those next steps are steps that are in progress and while i don't necessarily want to volunteer her Perhaps if there are other board members that want to have the same half hour get together, 20, 25 minute get together, if she or somebody else that has that same experience, it was a wonderful, it was, I mean, Gary, you could weigh in on it as well. It was, you know, 20 minutes we sat with her, got the a sense of how it's being utilized, what is she doing, and what her steps are in meeting with um, the elementary teachers. Um, and so just it's exactly along with what you know, Tara, Lauren were asking. It's happening now, which is we had the ability during board recognition to see it, right? Literally had just come out. So it was like, it was fantastic. Could I just make a suggestion, a suggestion that maybe we ask Ms. Zanino to come to um, one of our executive sessions for 20 minutes or whatever, um, and she can do that with the board. The one thing I can guarantee anybody is if you spend any time with Miss Anino, you come out smarter. So, and you are, right? Are you just so impressed no, it was with great. the facility she has about literacy instruction? The ki she knows all these kids, what programs she has helped her reading teachers prescribe for those children. And the reading staff is outrageous. I mean, the programs that you've supported, the direction we've gone with just not offering two choices has really made, I would say, POB one of the leaders in literacy instruction, lighting the way forward. Yeah. I, the, we've always believed, I mean, I've always believed that there's value to valid and reliable assessments that help us to identify vulnerabilities to students, but also to inform instruction. And one of the problems, even though I support assessments, including statewide assessments, and I think that we improve it, right? You kind of like mend it, don't end it approach. Um, one, one of the drawbacks is how um, slow it is to get the data and the information. And another one is how they tweak the results, if you will, and then don't share the full amount until months and months later, right? And so recently we were able for those that have kids that are in those grades, present company included, we get our state ELA, if you had your kid take it, you have your state math and ELA. And I believe that that's a valuable factor. It's one tool to help, right? It doesn't count in terms of grade, um, particularly if you have a kid that's on the cusp of whether they need AIS that could help, you know, um, inform the decision-making. But the value of NWEA assessments is, it was in one of the earliest slides. It, it was written up there. I don't think you said it out loud, but I think it's worth pointing out. Did you, did you say it out loud? which is it's virtually instantaneous, right? So it is 
within a day or two, the district gets it. And then once it's put on, and then when you get, it was uploaded a couple of weeks ago, when you get that sheet, like you get your state ELA and state math, but when you get your NWE, it answers the questions that we're talking about, right? It, see here, these scores, Yeah, on the bottom, the rationale, right? It's available within 24 hours. And so not only do you now have the teacher being informed about her present student as opposed to what the last year's cohort was, but you have the ability then to now have the rest of the school year and, and focus, right? And I, I, I guess there's a new phrase and we don't use differentiate. There's a different phrase now that they use that's virtually the same thing. <laughs> I don't know, I've heard... Uh, but I've heard people use it. I was like, oh, I, that must be the new, the new lingo for differentiate, differentiate instruction. But the point is it's instantaneous, right? And so for a parent's perspective, we get that sheet. And on that sheet, it shows you where your kid is, but also shows you the growth from the last one too. So you might, your kid might be in that one of the quadrants or another one, depending, right? High achievement, but low growth. And it shows how that growth compares to others in the cohort. And as a parent, then, even if you don't pay attention to the grades that were coming in every day or every week in that parent portal, you get that and you say, oh, what am I, you know, is, is this reflective? Um, and the question I have after all of that statement and report is the NWEA report and the state report don't always align. So you could have a student who is predicted to be or is said is at a level two in one of them, but a level three or four in the other. And I think it's important that parents shouldn't get crazed over the difference. But what as parents do we put more validity to? What, what do we think is a more reliable in terms of the meeting expectations component? I would rely on the NWEA for the one reason that you mentioned. The state assessments have been politicized. So there was a year where in my former district, 121 students fell below proficiency because after the test was given in August, they raised the cut scores and 122 kids dropped and then had to go into AIS, even though they might not have needed it. So NWEA is agnostic, it's a nonprofit, and it doesn't serve New York State politics. It just shows you how your child does on this continuum. And the immediate access to results has tremendous power to um, motivate students who don't necessarily see themselves growing as quickly as they might when they put in some effort. And um, you know, John Hattie has done work where the event happens and as soon as you get your feedback, that will motivate students. And I have seen that because RIT scores and Lexile levels move in 10 point increments and RITs move in single digit ones, but moving from a Fontes and Pinnell level, level from an M to a W could take two years. That's too long. But if I move from a thousand Lexile level to 1300 in a year, I'm a rock star. And I know most of my regions test questions live in the 1400 range and I'm a seventh grader, I'm ready to go. Right. right? So I would Great. NWA. My long answer to your short question. Oh, your short answer to my 10 minute, 10 minute question. But thank you. I just, I think it's a valuable conversation to have. Thank you. No, no Seth hit on a lot of the points that, that I hit on, but I, I actually wanted to pick up exactly where we left off, which is the real problem we have is that we want standardized tests to be able to measure the growth of our children, to make sure no one is left behind. There's no child left behind as the intent originally was, but the, the New York state tests aren't really worth the paper they're written on anymore. Let's be honest. You get your results four months later for elementary kids who aren't even being taught by the same teacher at a point where, you know, there is no continuum and they're, they're, they're skewed and they're graded based on the whims of politicians and they're garbage. And a lot of people don't take them. And you could disagree with me as a board member. I'm telling you right now, I never opted my kids out. I don't believe in opting out, but I think the state tests are garbage. These are valuable tests that give you valuable information that do not take days of education thrown away to do that if a teacher feels that they'd like to get an interim test or a parent because they think something else is going on, you could do it. It's not disrupting an entire school district. So what I want to know is, is 
why won't New York State, if they're intelligent people running it, just say, let's use this test, which is good and makes yeah. sense well, and is less disruptive? Gary, that makes perfect sense in a pedestrian world. But the problem also with state tests is once they tied it to the teacher evaluation system, all bets were off. And that is my gravest concern. And in the meeting I had last week, there is a push to count the NWA. And I hope they don't, because the minute they see that there's a test that you can get 100% of the parents to tell their kids, take it and do your best, because all we do is use it internally. Um, and then they politicize it. There, we'll have opt-out rates with NWEA. And I, I really don't want to see that happen. I just know the students in Plainview Old Bethpage are really well served with this. I know the parents, once we really get all of our teachers understanding these reports and we turn them around more quickly and become the basis of a parent-teacher conference, the place will be on fire and parents will understand the value of, you know, a whole assessment, a universal screener. So we'll deal with the state test, but as we get better at this and our teachers and our parents start understanding the value of them, we can pivot towards really making these the discussions we have and not concentrate on these state tests. But you know, the, the comment I'll give you is when you brought up the seventh grades on the NWEAs, you see these kids are doing just fine. How much time did you have to waste to figure out that the seventh grade test had problems in it and it wasn't a good valid test? And I don't think our teachers need to be wasting their time evaluating whether the state did a good job. I want them to work with our kids to improve our children's education. I just wanna say once again, I was at that session with Eileen Anino, wow. You were almost as enthusiastic as she was. I think she would give you an A. You did really good on it, but that's the kind of stuff. And I think that enthusiasm can spread to the teachers too. And you talked about kids, but I think it's even more important for the staff because if you can get a result that you can impact that child who's in your class, you're invested in it. What is the investment for a kid who's was taught by someone else four months ago on a test throughout a whole summer off? And there's one last thing about the NWA that's important to note is that, and I'm go, I just lost my thought, and I lost my thought. <laughs> well, when you get it back, you can jump right in. I, I would say though, just on your on your point, Gary, is that in that the the time of these exams, I think is really important because on a state exam, there are two days in a row, multiple hours per day. The NWA is one day, approximately an hour for the students, computer based, and it regulates, meaning that it. The, at the end, they'll have as much of a chance to get the question right as they can get it wrong. And that is what really sets it apart from the other time that it takes for those state exams. Yeah. Gary, I remembered. You can't fake smart and proficient on this test. You have to get five questions correctly to be pushed up to the next level. And they give you an analytic report of the kids who were able to game it, which is so interesting. So there were like five students in all the students we gave this to that were able to game it. They like tricked the system in guessing correctly and they overinflated. But more importantly is when you look at the seventh and eighth grade scores that show high proficiencies and students are still getting in C's and 70s, it gives us a targeted, it has nothing to do with ability. It has to do with motivation, disengagement, the things we worry about, maybe something else SEL going on. Tara? Yeah, that was the point. I was yeah, and and then on top of that, I think it gives you a further breakdown, right? So like it's it breaks it down even further into the skills. So like if you might do phenomenal in one area, but then have a not a def, either a deficit or a relative strength and and deficit, I guess, in in another area that allows the teacher to know where to focus you moving forward, right? Ginger? Yeah, first of all, I'm just thrilled that we have results so quickly and we can really help kids who are getting stymied. And I think for parents also, this is much better because they know the here and now as opposed to saying, well, there's going to be a summer, it was a lapse, now they have to go back. And I just think that it shouldn't be politicized. This is a test that is here that's very easy. And when we saw that sheet before, you could actually pinpoint, and I'd like to see that presentation so you know where that child is on that map and you can't deny it it's factual and I, I think it's wonderful I was so excited and I also like when we have comparisons
thank you for bringing this to the district. Um, this is exactly what assessments are supposed to do. And I uh, just wanted to say thank you for, for the information that was given. And there's no exhaustion and it's very difficult to argue with that. Yep. She is willing. Yes, I already answered. She's willing to come. We'll, we'll put her on. We have one place to see. We just have one ask the soup question that came in. Um, this is a parent of an eighth grader and a sixth grader. Um, we want to begin by thanking you for working out a plan where Dwali was a school holiday. We would like to submit this for oh, sorry, public participation. Uh, we, for the 2021 school year, sorry, this gave our family time to engage in our social religious activities and its true spirit, meet with other families who celebrated the holiday. My kids were happy the whole day and they proudly shared that their school board gave them the day off for their biggest holiday. I would like the school board to adopt a system similar to other surrounding school districts where we can account for Diwali as a holiday every year without trying to find a different way each year. I think this is the correct time to approach the calendar in a more systematic way. Consequently, our children and their cult culture will be acknowledged. Okay, we are now going up. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't read my um, seeing no other speakers um, and receiving no other questions from ask the superintendent public participation is now closed. Um, routine business. May I have a motion for routine business? Gary, second, Tara, and a hold separation or discussion? All those in favor of routine business? Thank you. Um, we're going to go on to new business. May I have a motion on 11.1 .1, approval of sixth period agreement. Susan, second, Lauren, any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. 11.2 um, approval for coach bus field trip. A motion set, the second, Ginger, any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. May I have a motion for 11.3 recommendation to approve revised consultant services agreement? Seth, second, Gary, any discussion? All those in favor? And may I have a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of obtaining legal advice from district council? Susan, second, Ginger. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. And 